Tywin Lannister is a very interesting character in both the Game of Thrones show and the A Song of Ice and Fire books. These two depictions of the same character do vary in a number of ways. I think the version that we get in the show is much more kind of perfect and just the ideal Machiavellian schemer. And I think that's thanks in large part to Charles Dance's fantastic performance might be my favorite performance in the entirety of Game of Thrones. That aside, both versions, book and show, of this character are crucial to the plot of A Song of Ice and Fire, and it's very important to consider how he exactly became the man he is when the story starts. There is one specific historical example in the past, recent past, of Westerosi history that involves Tywin scheming and failing miserably, and that failure results in the deaths of maybe thousands of people if we're looking at a butterfly wings sort of causation element there. Today we're going to take a look at Tywin Lannister's perhaps greatest failure, other than his legacy falling apart, as we take a peek into the defiance of Duskendale. Duskendale is a small castle and town on Blackwater Bay. It is a part of the Crown Land, and it is fairly close to King's Landing, the second closest castle other than Rosby, which I've also talked about in an earlier video. They were ruled at this point in history by House Darklyn. We see House Darklyn in House of the Dragon briefly. I believe there's a member of Rhaenyra's Kingsguard who is a Darklyn, but we do not see them in the main series for reasons that will become apparent. They rule there for a very long time. They predate the Targaryen rule of Westeros, and overall, we don't really know much about their history other than the few historical figures that do crop up in the record. Before we get into the events that lead to this defiance, we need to talk about the relationship between a king and his hand. Aerys II and Tywin Lannister were initially introduced during the War of the Nine Penny Kings, this series of conflicts that were fought in the Stepstones in order to put down the last of the Blackfyre pretenders. At that point, both Aerys II and Tywin were not the king and the lord, but rather just a prince and some heir to the Lannister fortune, and because of that, they were able to kind of bond on the battlefield. I believe it was Tywin who knighted Aerys II, the second. And overall, they were able to form this inseparable bond. However, that bond ends up breaking down as years go by. Aerys becomes king and sometimes makes some decisions that Tywin doesn't really like. There are a number of comments levied about Tywin's wife by Aerys as well during this era, and the two generally begin to bicker and not get along. It gets so bad that Aerys starts to just disregard anything that Tywin says, oftentimes doing the exact opposite, which very much gets on Tywin's nerves, as, as we see in the main series, Tywin is someone you have to listen to or he gets very angry. This defiance began much the way many other real-world conflicts began, that being a tax dispute. Lord Dennis Darklyn refused to pay his taxes due to some anger that has been lost to the historical record. Aerys II was very angry about this, as you have to pay taxes to the king, and was going to deal with it in a number of ways. Tywin Lannister very directly advised Aerys II, hey, do not go here, you should just send an army, they can deal with it. In order to piss off his hand, assumedly, Aerys II decided to go in person and quell this rebellion in the flesh. He only brings one Kingsguard knight with him, Sir Gwain Gaunt. However, when the two arrive, they are seized. The king is imprisoned, and Sir Gwain is killed by Sir Simon Hollard, the master of arms of this castle. Aerys is shoved, his beard is pulled, and he is ultimately imprisoned, and there is essentially a massive catastrophe in which the realm is left without a king for one of the first times in Westerosi history. Lord Darklyn didn't kill the king, which I find a bit strange, but rather imprisoned him. Lord Tywin Lannister soon amassed a huge host and descended on Duskendale, just sitting outside the walls and attempting to figure out what exactly is going to happen next, specifically because there is a very strange leverage to the situation, as the Darklands do have the king as a captive, and Tywin does not want to at least appear to get his king killed at this point. This stalemate goes on for well over half a year. We're going to step away from the historical record. I'm doing air quotes for a minute here so I can talk about some conspiracy theories that I wholeheartedly believe. Lord Darklyn, I don't think, could have acted alone in this instance. Kidnapping a king in this sort of monarchical system is essentially just a... You have to have a death wish to do it. There's no nothing he can hope to gain by holding King Aerys at this point. Either Aerys gets out and is able to just crush this house in return or they kill Ares and the house is crushed anyway. The only reason that Lord Darklyn would have done this was if someone promised him a pardon. 
My thought is that Tywin Lannister might have been behind this. Yes, he advised Aerys not to go to Duskendale, but as we said earlier, Aerys at this point was doing exactly the opposite of anything Tywin told him. If Tywin wanted him to go to Duskendale, he could not have acted any better. My thought is that uh, Lord Darklyn was acting kind of in lockstep with Lord Tywin Lannister, trying to remove this king from power and hopefully putting in another monarch who might be able to be more easily manipulated by Lord Tywin. We see Tywin manipulate Joffrey in the later books, and perhaps he wanted another younger prince to enter the fold as the new king at this point. About half a year into this prolonged siege, Tywin gave a final ultimatum. Surrender the king, or we will burn this castle to the ground. This is a very strange wish for a hand of the king to make, as the king would certainly die if he did this. But he did it anyway. Essentially, he gave them one final night to turn the king back over, or they would all meet with an early grave. Or they would have, at least, if there wasn't for one specific element. One man who was not accounted for by Lord Tywin, not accounted for by Lord uh, Darklyn, and certainly not accounted for by King Aerys. Barristan Selmy of the Kingsguard. This is Sir Barristan the Bold's finest hour. Rather than waiting with Lord Tywin to destroy Duskendale the following day, Barry decided to take matters into his own hands and rescue his king. Under the cloak of darkness, he scaled the walls unseen, first the outer layer of the castle and then into the inner layer of the keep, disguising himself as a beggar and climbing over multiple layers. He eventually arrived at the dungeons where he found the king and freed him, and while bringing him to safety, he was able to avenge his sworn brother by slaying that Simon Hollard who had killed him earlier. Before the castle's gates were closed, he was managed to get a horse and bring the king through them to safety despite taking an arrow to the chest in the process. Before dawn, Tywin's plan was foiled, and Barristan and Aerys II were safely outside of Duskendale. While this was a great feat for Sir Barristan, we later learn in his viewpoint chapters in A Dance with Dragons that it is tinged with regret. To quote from one of his chapters, If he had not gone into Duskendale to rescue Aerys from Lord Darklyn's dungeon, the king may as well have died there as Tywin Lannister sacked the town. Then Prince Rhaegar would have ascended the Iron Throne, mayhaps to heal the realm. Duskendale had been his finest hour, yet the memory tasted bitter on his tongue. And Barristan is likely right about this. Aerys II did not take well to half a year in captivity. It either greatly accelerated his madness, or according to some, planted the madness wholesale. He was not the same man coming out of that dungeon, and we saw it nearly immediately, as his vengeance was immediate and terrible. The entirety of Lord Darklyn's line was wiped out, and House Hollard was executed as well. Only one survivor was left, that being Dauntus Hollard, who we encounter in the main series. Overall, this is a tragic event, and we see almost mirroring Tywin, his once very close friend, and how he dealt with the Reigns and the Tarbex when they rebelled. I think the defiance of Duskendale is something that should be considered when thinking about Tywin Lannister. I think it's a very great kind of litmus test for how you look at him. I think that it is a very complicated scheme and one that really, by all accounts, should have gone quite well for him. His only downside was thinking that Barristan was human. Uh, but overall, it does show that Tywin is a mortal man. He has failed, and he does fail. We see that especially in the main series, when his entire legacy collapses within, I'd say, a month of his death, as his children are not living up to his legacy, and he is no longer around to enforce the fear that kept everyone in line under the Lannisters. And this may end up returning in Barristan's story later on as well, specifically the fact that we see his finest hour turned bitter with the shade of memory. I think that that could very much be telling as to his actions in Marine as well. It's important to think about when he's remembering this. He's remembering Duskendale partway through his coup against his daughter Zalorak, a coup that is likely going to be entirely backfiring on him, given the fact that there is very little evidence that his daughter is the Harpy. In the books, in the show, he's probably the Harpy. With that said, I think that that is a very interesting area, and I think that we will see in the Winds of Winter that maybe Barristan made the wrong choice there, and it will come back to bite him, as he is currently riding into battle, followed by disloyal sellswords and pit fighters who hate him because he killed one of their own. I'd love to do another video on Marine at some point, or just that entire situation, or who the Harpy is. Uh, let me know if you're interested in that. I, I'd love to talk about it, but I know that uh, Daenerys' plotline in Dance with Dragons is somewhat contentious, to say the least.
Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe. I really appreciate it, and it really helps me grow the channel. What do you think of Tywin Lannister? Do you agree that he is kind of a different character in the books and in the show? Do you think they're more or less the same? I'd love to hear your opinions and thoughts, and I'd love to hear other suggestions for things I should cover before. This is very history-oriented for one of my videos, which is kind of fun. It's making me go back to my history teacher days a little bit, even if I'm just recounting fake history in this case. I really appreciate all your time watching, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. I'll be back with more videos in the very near future. See you soon.